And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with her garden <laughs> questions. What is so funny? We're just sitting here. There. We do this. We've been doing this for decades. Anyway, uh, Lisa comes in and just shares your garden questions. Just what's going on. Now you got me giggling. My goodness. Uh, okay, so uh, happy Mother's Day, belated. Oh, well, thank you. And it was yes. a good backyard barbecue, grilling, mm -hmm. time with family. Yeah, it was a great day. Wonderful food. You did your magic grilling, and it was very good. So Lisa brought home an eight-pound <laughs> filet. I put Tenderloin. it on the rotisserie tenderloin. So I put it um, put it on the rotisserie, and it was magic. You get this herbal thing that you do. Oh my gosh, it was so good. Well, I do that for you because I know you love to be out in the backyard yeah. grilling, and so the tenderloin like that takes a couple hours. Yeah, that's right. You do it slow. Yeah. So I figured that would give you all the time you need back yeah. there. <laughs> the guys loved it. Yes. So all the men were back there. Your dad actually got me aside at the very end. So we had a so grilled came into work in the morning. Went home at like two, put the powered up the grill. We had mm -hmm. family over at dinner for about four thirty or five, and then just stayed until everyone just decided to leave. Mm -hmm. And your dad's leaving. You know, Harold Waters, he's the founder of the Garden Center, and so he goes, Ken, you know how special this is. I'm going, what do you mean, Harold? Because well, having this much family together, this much family doesn't get together that often anymore. I'm going, Harold. You had a bunch of daughters, and I had a bunch of daughters, and I think daughters just naturally come together no matter what. Isn't that a blessing? So mm -hmm. we just enjoyed each other. So that meant a lot. Yeah. That your dad, who's 80-something, mm -hmm. 80, 80 84, yeah. three? Five? <laughs> 90? I have no idea. He's not 90. Once you get over, that. like, I don't know, 85, you're Does all it the matter? same age. Yeah. yeah, it's all the same age. Anyway, we, we digress about yes. your Mother's Day. Happy it Mother's Day. Thank you very much. It was a pleasant one. Do we have uh, garden questions we that we're asking folks? We do have garden questions, you bet. So Jack is looking for a very fast growing tree. He has a neighbor building a house behind him. Of course he wants to block him. Yeah. Uh, so he's looking for a fast growing, easy growing tree. So evergreen, I gather, or because he said yes, definitely evergreen and fast growing were the most gotcha. important. Okay, so those are easy. So I, was, I thought he's going to go down cottonwood, willow, sycamore. Yeah. Those are deciduous trees. Mm -hmm. They grow faster. The deciduous trees grow faster than evergreens, but then they lose their leaves in the winter, and you're left mm -hmm. bare or unprivatized mm -hmm. for like five months. And so the fastest growing evergreens. Let's see if I can go down the list. It's probably Deodore cedar, mm -hmm. Austrian pine. It's a pine tree. It looks like a, it's a long needle pine that looks like a ponderosa, only it holds its foliage right down on the ground. I would say Arizona cypress, mm -hmm. fast up to about 20, 25 feet tall. Uh, and then it would be spruce. I don't know. It's a whole bunch of other stuff that's not quite as fast, but they're methodical. So you mm -hmm. put like we, we used uh, Spartan junipers ourselves. Mm -hmm. They'd been in five, six, seven years, and they were planted small, and now they're easily 10, 12 feet tall, probably six, seven feet wide. Mm -hmm. We put it, we zigzagged them through the front yard, and it's just this big living wall. And so if you've got some time, you can do that. Another idea would be placing a great big, a big one, spending the money on a on a large specimen, put it right where the where the offense is, and put smaller ones on either side mm -hmm. so you have time to finally catch up. So you can have your, you can spread the landscape dollars out and, and get that. Of course, if money is no object, you can just go all big. Just go all big. We've got them all in. So they're they're all available. So you can do that too. Okay. So a few things to choose from. Deodor cedar, Austrian pines, mm -hmm. Arizona cypress, Colorado spruce, and then everything else. Okay. All right. Next question is from Lori. She's looking for recommendations for plants to make a hedge that are rabbit and deer resistant. <laughs> That's a hard one for a hedge. Mm -hmm. So a short hedge, I don't know what size she wants her hedge, but boxwood's the number one seller. Boxwood is a low growing, maybe it gets up to about hip, maybe four, maybe five feet tall, something mm -hmm. like that. It's a good, strong, green, consistent, and nothing eats it. 
In the shade, the same thing would be like that. That'd be rhododendrons and azaleas. They can be hedged as well in the more shaded areas. So I don't know if she's not giving me. Holly, isn't Holly? Holly's another one you could yeah. do with. That's another great, great choice. Mm -hmm. Out in the sun, uh, if you want a head high thing, you go with um, what would it, cot cotoneaster, mm -hmm. red clusterberry cotoneaster, and silverberry. It's a yeah. native plant that grows wild here. They'll easily get up head high and you can't see through them. I'm sure there's some others I just can't think is, about. Is uh, Texas privet deer resistant? I can't remember. You know, it is. You just want to stay away from red tip photinia. Yeah. Everything eats on that, including Uomus. bugs mm -hmm. and disease <laughs> and pestilence and deer and rabbits. Mm -hmm. So um, euonymus, they'll eat on that. But they don't eat on the boxwoods. They don't eat on cotoneasters. Mm -hmm. They don't eat on silverberry. I'm sure there's a couple others you could play with, too. Okay. All right. Good recommendations. Go. Yeah. Just got to check them out and see what size and height and width you need and all that. Yeah. All right. Well, Lindsay's new to gardening. She now has a raised bed. Her husband built for her. Yay! She's you got there. a good husband. Keep him. Yeah. She's going to be putting her <laughs> veggies, tomatoes, pepper, blah, 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 blah. She came down and she got the 6447 fertilizer. Right. And she okay. also got the root and grow. Her question is, can she use those two together, or do you only use one or the other? Gotcha. And then also her second question is, how often is she probably going to need to be watering that bed? Gotcha. So, so good, good, all good questions. So, so for the listeners that are tuned in or are watching the vlog, um, so the the six four four seven. So we made a fruit and vegetable food for the mountains of Arizona. It's unique for here, this higher elevation, and we know you're going to need calcium. And so the seven is 7% 7 calcium, and that's what that is. So mm -hmm. it's granular, it's organic, pelletized, so you can sprinkle it on the soil, water it in, easier to use. And so it's made for vegetables, perfect. She did, she did good. Now, I'm usually gonna plant that, sprinkle that on top of the soil, and as you water or it rains, every time that water hits that, it'll release and get a little bit of food. And organics release very slowly over a long period of time. You're going to water in with the root and grow. This is a transplant shock. It's basically a compost tea that we make here, here at Waters Garden Center. And it's great for transplant shock. The best houseplant food you've ever seen. The best cactus food you've ever had. Because it's compost tea. Now, you can use those together. No problem. Uh, again, compost tea is more available right now. Mm -hmm. It's going to stimulate root growth. You need that. And then the the... Uh, fruit and vegetable food is going to release over a, a good six, eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And then you're probably going to reapply every six to eight weeks. The plants will just stop growing all of a sudden. So you kind of go, oh, they're running out of juice. Uh, then as soon as you, you hit them again with that fruit and vegetable food, boom, it takes right off. Mm -hmm. How often to water is much, much trickier. <laughs> so probably right now we're watering every three days. Right. The vegetable flower gardens. Mm -hmm. We just heat it up this week, so maybe it'll go down to every two days. But in the peak, in another month, you know, in June, it's going to be 95, dry, prevailing southwest wind. You just got to get your plants to live through June. <laughs> just make it until the next, till the monsoons or the humidity goes back up with some shade cover. Uh, so just get them through June, and then, and then usually the pressure throttles back on you. So you might have to water every day. And make sure you water in the morning mm -hmm. really you want to focus whether this is a raised bed like she's got or just in the ground or or we're in containers wherever it is it's very important to water flowers and vegetables herbs uh in the morning we're talking dawn we're getting them hydrated before the heat of the day i'd say have your irrigation all done by eight o'clock in the morning nine at the latest so plants are plumped up juicy hydrated before they go into the heat of the day and then try, try, try to avoid watering late in the afternoon, mm -hmm. evening. That's when all the disease and pestilence cap. That's when bugs, that's when a mildew takes over. That's when black spot, vertinillum wilt on tomatoes. That's when things happen, when plants are warm and wet and it's dark. Those are, th that's a trifecta for, for, for doom. <laughs> you don't want that for your veg. Make sure true. they're dry going in the evening plumped up and moist going into the heat and you'll have more success so mm -hmm. we are out of time lisa nice nice hanging out in the studio with you babe yeah. yeah we'll be right back after this